part of your grade that includes participation. So today we're going to talk about strategies for, strategies for improving learning and memory. Um, there's a slides that are a little bit different than what I posted online. Most of that's just so that has to do with some of the questions I'm going to ask you. Um, I've, as I go through the semester, I kind of update things and organize them to make sure that they are in better organizational, um, in a better organization. And so if sometimes it takes me a day or two to get the uh, slides up to date. But today we're talking about strategies for improving learning and memory. So the first thing we're going to do actually is on Top Hat. Um, if I could figure out how to hit the right button. So we go directly here. Right here. I'm still working. They changed this whole thing and how it works. And so I'm still working on there we go. Still working out how to figure all this out. So very briefly. Uh, describe the study strategy you are most likely to use to prepare for an exam. Again, very briefly, just, you know, what's your go-to strategy for studying? What's the most likely thing you are to do? talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. So uh, the reason I start the semester off with this topic is this is one of those areas that has the potential to benefit you throughout the semester. So the first thing we're going to talk about today is how learning is misunderstood. Most people think they know how to learn, but actually it turns out we're all pretty bad at this. Uh, we can all do better. So this, the goal here is to learn how to learn better, so improve your learning. And in a lot of ways, to make it so that you can be more successful without having, honestly, to put as much effort into it. So the idea here is to use the most efficient, effective strategies uh, to be successful and also uh, not spending a lot of time sort of spinning your wheels doing things that you don't need to do. So we'll talk about how um, learning and retrieval are tied together. We'll talk about mixing things up a bit, embracing desirable difficulties, how to avoid illusions of knowing, the myth of learning styles, and then we'll finish up with some encoding strategies. So we often engage in the least effective memory strategies because they feel like they work. This is one of the biggest problems with uh, trying to get students and uh, even I've done lectures to parents to understand about memory is we have this feeling about how our memory works that is almost entirely inaccurate. So for example, repetition is one of the least effective strategies. That is, constantly repeating something to yourself is absolutely the least effective strategy you can engage in trying to remember something. Unless you're only going to try to remember it for the next minute, it's not going to do you much good over the long haul. And so trying to get uh, this out of how we teach students how to study is something that we're all working on in this field. So. To demonstrate to you that repetition is not an effective strategy, first thing I want you to do is put your, well, you're going to have to use your phone. Only look at the screen. Um, 
because what I want you to do is write on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being the lowest, how likely you think you would be able to accurately draw the Apple logo from memory. No looking at the Apple logo either. Because the next thing you're going to do is you're going to try to draw it. So you're going to need a piece of paper here in a sec. Go ahead and take out a piece of paper and try to draw the Apple logo completely from memory. Again, no peeking, because I'm going to have you pick out the Apple logo out of a lineup here in a second. I know it's hard for some of you because it's on the keyboard in front of you, but. <coughs> I'm not going to judge your artistic ability. But when you look at your version of the logo, is the bite out of the right side? Does the stem show the right direction? Does the bottom of the apple look right? So the next thing on top hat, this is one of the things you'll just click on. Which one of these do you think is the correct apple logo? This is the first time I've done one of these using Top Hat. Is anyone having trouble with it? Yeah, is it not? Usually when you click on it, it should do something. Anyone who's successfully done it? Yeah, how's it worked out? Did you just touch on it? or? Yeah. Um. That's a good question. So it may be an issue with um, which operating system you have. I'll email customer service. It's the first time I've done one of these click on areas um, lately. Let's see if I can find some. Well, let's see what most of you picked. So this gives you kind of a hot spot uh, map of where people have been clicking. Crowd's pretty right, though. It is actually B. So I want to show you B is. things that we'll be doing as I go through these kinds of things is I can set them for review. So for when I start asking you actual questions about review material, you'll be able to see what the correct answer is. So it should actually show you with a circle around what the 
correct answer is. Well, the point of that exercise is to demonstrate that if repetition works, this is something that should have been easy, right? How many times a day do you see the Apple logo? Right? If you have an iPhone, uh, like four zillion times a day. Uh, right now, I mean, I can see 10, 15 Apple logos from here. If repetition worked, it should be a no-brainer. And most people selected the right answer, but quite a few people, quite a few people got it wrong. Because as I was starting to allude to when you started looking at your drawings, I don't know which way this thing goes or if there's a thing at the bottom or which side the bite's out of or all sorts of questions. So this comes from a pretty great study by Blake Navarian and Castle. One out of their 85 participants correctly drew the Apple logo. Only half of participants could correctly choose the logo from that lineup you just saw. In fact, that comes directly from their paper. <coughs> participants were really confident in their ability to pick the right logo and to draw the logo before the test, certainly much less so afterward. A couple of lessons here. One, simple repetition, glancing through your notes, glancing, glancing through what you've highlighted, looking through your textbook, has about this level of processing to it. That is, if you're just simply looking at surface details, you're not going to remember something later. That's the reason why we don't remember the Apple logo, because we don't study it. We also don't ever try to remember it. In your entire life, have you ever tried to remember what the Apple logo looks like? No, of course not. That's one of the reasons why that memory is so terrible, because you've never actually had to describe to somebody what the Apple logo looks like, which makes this very different from things like course material or even you know, how to get to your house. You've had to describe that at some point. All sorts of things are very different. So it is a bit of a contrived setting, but the point here is that learning is a skill that requires effort and deliberative practice. If you're not putting effort into your studying, it's probably not doing you much good. And that's the really important thing. Studying should actually require effort. Otherwise, you probably don't, probably not, you're probably just wasting your time. Um, and I don't want you to do that because, frankly, I'd rather waste my time doing fun things than studying in a way that, doesn't, that isn't effective. The goal here is to get you better, to get you good at it. So if you do it right, you can study less, and learn more. These are potentially ways in which you can uh, learn the material better in a shorter amount of time. So we're talking about being efficient by capitalizing on the best science we have in this area. And so that's what I want to talk about today are some practices you can instill based on cognitive science. So today we're going to start off talking about retrieval and memory. This is summarized both in the article that was with your syllabus and also the one I posted online, <coughs> which gets into this idea of testing effects. We'll start first with retrieval practice and then talk about uh, testing. So the first thing to engage in is what we call retrieval practice. You wouldn't show up to a recital without having practiced. You wouldn't show up to a basketball game without having practiced wouldn't show up really any competition without having practiced whatever skill it is that you're going to engage in first. Yet, students will walk into exams without ever having tested themselves first. What you need to engage in is you practice your ability to remember. That is, you try to retrieve information, recall it from memory, and you'll actually get much better at it, just like any other skill. The more you retrieve a memory, the more likely you are to be able to retrieve it later. So you don't have to just sit and answer test questions. You can do this while you're riding your bike, while you're running on the treadmill. You can simply try to remember things from class and think about it because you're then engaging in that kind of retrieval practice. So this comes from um, some Rodiger and Karpicki studies um, and Rodiger and Paschler, where if you look at studying and then studying again versus studying and testing. Five minutes later, that second study session, you're a little bit better. So if it's five minutes before the exam, 
this is a shot you got here, right? It's a quick restudy. Never hurts. Never hurts to flip through those notes at the beginning of class right before an exam. But the best thing to do is to test yourself because two days later, you're going to study, you know, in the days leading up to the exam. Two days later, far better memory performance, and certainly a week later, much better memory performance for participants who had been tested over the material versus those who had studied again. So tests are not just a means of assessment. They are actually learning opportunities. In fact, my friend Mark McDaniel, whose book I'll talk about here in a bit, and some of this uh, talk today is based on, <coughs> um, him and Rodiger, Rodiger wrote this really great book called Make It Stick. Anyway, Mark talks about, uh, in his classes, instead of having quizzes, he has learning opportunities. Uh, and that's really what quizzes are. They're opportunities to learn the material. It's why you'll have those reading quizzes. It's also why we'll have some review questions during class. So I'm trying to maximize the amount of time you spend trying to remember information about the course so that you can remember it later. It's also the reason why we have a cumulative final. This is based on a long-standing, very robust finding in the cognitive literature called the generation effect. And the basic finding is when you generate something yourself, you're much more likely to remember it later. So when you're trying to remember something yourself versus listening to somebody else's lecture or reading your notes or reading the textbook, when it comes from you, you're much more likely to remember it later. So in these classic studies, we talk about generated versus read items. This is a pretty simple kind of experiment. Now, cognitive psychologists love word lists and word pairs. We like to get people to remember words because, well, they're easy to work with. So in the generation effect ex experiments, what participants are asked to do is either generate a word in response to another. So if I say the word hot, what's the first word that comes to mind? Cold, usually. Unless it's after lunch, sometimes it's dog. Um, <coughs> it's usually hot and cold. You generated that word yourself. Versus reading items, where I give you cat and dog together. So you read those two pairs of items together. You're much more likely to remember those items you generated yourself versus those ones you read. And that simply has to do with the way memory works. It's a much more robust way, much more elaborative way of learning and encoding material. So as we go through all of these things we're going to talk about today, this question of generation comes up again and again. So I use my own examples in class that are related to my experiences. But if you, as you're studying, generate your own example, it's a really great way for studying material. In fact, in some of these interactive demonstrations we're going to do throughout the semester, I'm going to have you come up with examples, talk to somebody next to you about your examples, you share examples, and try to come up with several different ways in which we'll capitalize on this finding uh, as you are uh, learning the material. But that's in here. In other classes, you'll have to do all this work yourself. So generate your own examples, generate your own definitions, test yourself. All of these are great ways in which you can actually capitalize on uh, the best ways in which we know how to study. Now, so look. That we have our examples. So this would be the example of generated versus read items. Generation, generally superior. We also know that testing is superior to restudying. That is, if you test somebody over the material, they're far more likely to remember it later than if they just simply restudy it uh, themselves. So one of the things we won't do in here, I'm not going to ask you to sit and read from your textbook uh, or sit and look through your notes. I'm going to ask you to engage in the material, try to remember it. Uh, I highly encourage you. There's really no reason to try to look up answers as you're doing those reading quizzes. Do them from memory. You'll get a lot more out of them. That's what they're designed for. They're there to help you learn more than anything else. Important thing to understand about testing effect is it does work with varieties of test types. Now, the amount of sort of return you get a little different depending on the exam format, but this works with multiple choice questions, with short answer and essay questions. It even works with open and closed book uh, exams for long-term retention. And this is where, uh, when I'm giving this talk <coughs> to colleagues, they always question why this would be the case. But as students, you guys can probably figure it out. If you're doing an open book exam and you read the question, what do you do first? Do 
you look at the, oh, go ahead. Yeah, you come up with the answer. <laughs> like, you're not going to look in the book first. You're going to try to come up with the answer first, right? You're going to see if you know it. And then if you don't know it, you'll go. And then, of course, if you were like me, you'd answer it and then go back and make sure your answer was right. Um, <coughs> but, yeah, you're going to try to answer it yourself. I took, when I was in law school, um, one of the classes you have to take as a first-year law student is called Civil Procedure. And we had textbooks. Literally, the stack that I took into the exam was an open book exam. The stack was about this high for a three-hour exam. There's no way you could flip through every book that we had <laughs> in there to find the answer in that exam to try to get it done. Um, now, ask me what I remember about civil procedure. It's a different, different question, because we had one exam for an entire year's worth of work. Um, so law schools aren't very good at capitalizing on the testing effect. Law schools are a whole weird place on their own. But open book and closed book exams do have similar long-term retention. This is one of the reasons when I teach an online class, I don't go through this huge amount of effort to keep students from um, looking at their materials. There's all sorts of ways you can do that. Some places make you go places and answer questions. Anyone take an online class like that? We have to go like to a library. Yeah, do you have to go to a library somewhere? Yeah, high school. Yeah. So you have to go and have somebody proctor the exam. Um, my students learn because they <laughs> I test them so much uh, that they're going to learn no matter what. So. One of the important things uh, as part of this, though, is feedback. Feedback is important because it increases retention of what we call low confidence correct responses. So this is what happens when you answer something correctly, but you aren't very confident in your response. We want to boost that confidence so you know it was the right answer. So a couple things in here. Uh, the way the reading quizzes work, you have until 11.59 on Sunday uh, to finish them, and then at midnight, it clicks over and the correct answers show. So you can always go back as soon as su Monday rolls around, you can go and check your answers. Um, and please tell me if there's a, an answer you think is wrong, because most of those questions come from the textbook's test bank, because they're there to test you over the, um, over the test, over the, sorry, the textbook material. And I've discovered they're not always good at knowing the right answer to their own question. That's a, another conversation for another day. Um, but we want to make sure we're, we're giving you the correct um, responses. So in this class, those quizzes will be available for you to study from. All the review questions that we do in class uh, that I've talked about, and we'll see some of these here in a bit, uh, those, as soon as we're done with them, they'll be available for review. And your exams, you'll get back um, usually the next class period particularly now that I have this new pretty cool app that can scan um, Scantron sheets with my phone. So it's actually very cool. It's a very quick way to score exams. <coughs> so the other thing that uh, providing feedback does is it reduces later false memory for incorrect responses. So if you answer something incorrectly, I don't want you to learn the incorrect answer. Right? You, need, you need to know that that was wrong and actually provide uh, the right answer later. So again, that's one of the reasons why I give your exams back. I write new exam questions. <coughs> um, I encourage you, because not everyone does this, um, because they don't think they can keep writing new exam questions or they're lazy or I don't know. They think you're going to sell them to the highest bidder whatever. But if they do that, go to their office and make sure you take a look at that exam so you can see what you got wrong. Because you need that kind of feedback. That's how you learn. You want to know what you got wrong and you want to you need to do it's you need to learn how to do better. Feedback's really important. So it's really um, something uh, I preach a lot about. One of the other things we're going to talk a little bit more about the spacing effect, but spacing out testing results in pretty dramatic improvements in retention. This comes from another paper by Jeff Karpicki. Um, basic idea here is if you test people sort of over time rather than just one big test, you get dramatic improvement. So from a study strategy, when you review your notes, engaging in that retrieval practice, testing yourself, these are all good ways uh, to practice for the exam. So Quizlet, there's all sorts of great ways in which you can uh, learn how to do this kind of thing. 
want to show you a little bit of data from one of my classes. This is from my uh, cognition class at Clemson University. This is when I first started using Top Hat. So similar to what you guys have, um, they could earn up to 100 points. Theirs were in-class quizzes, so they got two points per question. Um, so they could earn up to 100 points. So anything above this isn't contributing to their grade. This is a correlation between the number of questions they answered correctly and their final grade. Um, and what we found is, or what I found, I should say, is that 72% of their final grade could be predicted by their performance on the quizzes. So students that were taking all the quizzes, obviously one student did not. Um, <laughs> you don't want to be down here. Uh, taking all the quizzes, thinking about them, answering them correctly, results in much higher performance. So that kind of repeated testing resulted in much better performance. One of the things we also know, and one of the reasons why I asked you what your uh, study strategies were, is students don't think to test themselves. Anybody put in testing yourself as part of your study response? A few of you. Um, one of the reasons I'm going to come back and ask you about this uh, later in the semester to see how you've been studying, and then we can kind of compare the two. Um, so students don't often test themselves when studying. One of the problems we talked about is what we call an illusion of confidence. Um, and what happens with the illusion of confidence is we feel like we have learned something. And this is one of the things um, I talk about a lot. I think I talked about it the first day of class. I know I just talked about it with my cognition class a little while ago. Is we can study something feel like we know it, feel like we're competent, that we've understood it, we really, we're going to remember it later, and then come back and discover we have not. Anyone studied for an exam, felt very confident, spent six hours studying the day before, walk into the exam the next day, and got nothing? Have you had that happen? It's the worst feeling in the world, isn't it? <laughs> right? You open that exam and you're like, oh, shit. Um, which has now been recorded for all posterity. So people are going to be listening on YouTube to these lectures and go, God, he swears in class a lot. Um, so <laughs> that's what we call an illusion of confidence, uh, where we believe we know things and we don't really. And we're going to revisit this idea here in a little bit. It's the most often reported um, study habit in uh, deaf study is repeated reading material. People read and reread, and highlight. Highlighting is great if you want to find something later. The whole point of highlighting something is so you don't have to search through the text for it, but it's not a study tool. That is, running that highlighter across it is not going to magically transmit it to your brain. Um, and it's not a very deep level of processing, but it can help you find something later. That's the only reason to try to highlight things, is to try to find it later. <coughs> um, so the next general area, so testing yourself, engaging in retrieval practice, great strategy. Uh, the next thing I encourage is for um, you to space out your practice and kind of mix up your practice. So we call this distributed practice uh, or space practice. We'll also talk about what's called interleaved studying. These are all kind of related issues. So spacing out your practice results in greater learning. And the essential issue here is what we call space versus mass study, which is also sometimes called interleaved study. So in the spacing effect, which is a very old and robust finding in the literature, first discovered by uh, Hermann von Ebbinghaus in 1885, whom we'll talk about on Monday, the basic finding is if you have participants study something in a massed fashion, that is, several times in a row, versus distributed or spaced out. So they study one word, and they get some other words, and they get that word again, and they get some other words, and they get that, that word again. Um, and that's a very short summary of a long series <laughs> set of literature. But the basic finding is, is that massing study, that is putting it all together in one session, is far less effective than spacing it out over time. So if you look at the more applied studies in this area, you can have people study passage, say, for an hour one day, or you can have them study 15 minutes each day over four days. So we're still at an hour, right? The 15 minutes each over four days is far more effective than that one hour at one time. 
So spacing out your study is actually a really great way to uh, get better memory, do better on your exams. It's a really robust finding. So I want to take you through some of my favorite examples in this area that show how interleaving or sort of spacing out practice uh, can work. So one of the, when we talk about interleaving, we're not necessarily talking, or I'm not necessarily talking about sort of studying on different days. Now we're actually talking about even within a single study session. And the idea is that you want to kind of switch from one thing to the other, switch it up a bit. <coughs> so um, in uh, this great study by Nick Cornell, uh, and one of the Bjorks, I'm not sure if that's Bob or Elizabeth, uh, learning to identify artist painting styles was much better in what they call an inductive learning paradigm. So one of the things that art history classes tend to do is they have you look at 47 paintings by one author, uh, one author by one artist, and then another 50 paintings by some other artist, and you're supposed to figure out how to tell the difference between the two painting styles. Does that summarize that? somewhat well, having never taken an art history class in my entire life, I'm only assuming that that's how it works, and that's how students have told me it works. So you spend a bunch of time studying one painter versus another. Well, what Nate um, found is that if you switch from one artist to the next, each time you switch sort of paintings that you're looking at, what that does is, and he calls this inductive learning because it induces people to start looking at the differences between artist styles. So instead of trying to memorize what a Manet looks like versus a Monet, and again, we're going to exhaust my knowledge of art very quickly, um, you start looking at the differences between the two. So rather than looking at the same artist over and over again, you look at one versus the other. In this particular study, they looked at learning grammatical structure in English learning adults, um, switching things up rather than focusing on one grammatical structure than the next. Uh, switching things up worked better. Abstract mathematics, this is an area that's really important when we start talking about mathematical learning, long-term comprehension, long-term learning. <coughs> I've last I checked, um, when so, uh, there are people who look at uh, things like mathematics textbooks, there was one mathematics textbook that does this right. But most of them do it this way. When you go, now your math professor assigns problems from the back of the chapter, right? And then they assign, like, do all the odd ones, or do one, three, five, seven, you know, whatever. Almost every mathematics textbook puts all the same problem types together, right? So you do five problems of one type and then five problems of another type. It's a terrible way to learn. So if you're actually doing math homework, um, do them out of order. I would turn them in an order. <laughs> do them out of order. And the reason for that is you start to develop this illusion of confidence again. So you solve the first problem, and it's probably the hardest, right? And then you just take the same solution and apply it to the next one, because it's just like the one before. So they're just applying what you just did, and you do that again. But you start to feel like you're really good and good at it, when really what you're getting good at is you know, applying the same solution that you just did previously. But in an exam, they're not going to put them in that same order. You're going to get one problem of one type, another problem of a different type. If you even get two problems of the same type, that would be surprising. So you'll learn much more by switching up the order. Uh, in this study by Birnbaum, they looked at identifying specific animal species. And then my favorite, because this one uh, resonates uh, at home for me, and I think it provides the best example of this phenomenon of interleaved study practice, is in learning piano me melodies. You guys probably have all at some point had to try to learn an instrument, right? Everyone has to go through that. For me, it was a trombone. I spent, you know, one semester in sixth grade trying to learn how to play the trombone. Um, but I was in choir. I was actually in, I was a founding member of the Pride of Greenville Men's Chorus in South Carolina. <coughs> and one of the things people that are teaching music have a tendency to do when they practice music, how do you practice music? Anyone here a musician? So how do you usually practice when you're learning a piece? So you do it over and over again, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which is how, this is a classic way to do it. And one of the problems that happens is you'll get better at it by the time you're on that sixth run. And then you'll come back a week later, 
you won't know it all, right? Does that sound about right? <laughs> you don't know very well. Um, what happens, and this is the reason why this is so hard, is because you want to feel like you're getting better. And so doing that same piece over and over again feels good because you feel like you're really, man, I'm really learning it. The problem is, is you're not learning it over the long haul, you're learning it over the short haul. Uh, in this particular study, they found that s switching from one piece to the next and then to a different piece and then back again, so interleaving which pieces you practice, resulted in much better long-term learning of the piano medleys th melodies themselves uh, and more accurate ability to try to uh, play the pieces themselves. So long-term learning, it's much better if you switch from one thing to the next so that you don't fall prey to that illusion of confidence. So you actually can, you're much better at gauging your learning in this kind of instance when you have switched from one thing to the other and then back again, because then you know, oh, I didn't really learn that piece. I've just got good at doing it in a row. So basically what we call priming. Um, once you've run the same motor program, it's fresh, it's easier, it's what we call fluent. Uh, and so while you haven't learned it, you have this sort of residual knowledge uh, about what you've done that doesn't, isn't associated with long-term uh, learning. The problem with math study is this results in this metacognitive illusion. Math practice tends to result in this illusion of competence. That is, the more we do something in a row, the more likely we are to think that we've gotten better at it when actually we haven't. Again, this is a perfect example of that. As math practice continues, we use this what we call ease of acquisition heuristic, which means that each time we play that piano piece each time we study our notes, each time um, we try to solve a problem, it gets easier and easier. And so it feels like we've learned, when in actuality it's just because we've just done the same thing. So unfortunately, this tends to result in little long-term retention and is in itself an illusion. Because each time we think it's easier, we think we've learned when that ease of acquisition is simply because it's familiar. <coughs> and that's a serious problem if we're going to try to have long-term learning. And again, the goal is, you're studying for an exam, that you accurately be able to gauge your learning. So what do we do? Um, well, let's finish up why does the spacing effect work. Well, it's important to understand the relationship between episodic memory and knowledge. These are terms that we haven't quite introduced yet in this um, class, but episodic memory is linked to specific contexts such as time and place. So what did you do this morning? What did you do yesterday? What did you do last week? Uh, what was your high school graduation like? Things that are linked to specific times and places. Knowledge or semantic memory is independent of any learning context. So you don't have to remember when and where you learned it. It is simply part of your knowledge. So most of you probably can ride a bike. You don't have any context associated with that as to when and where you learned it. That is, you don't have to remember where you were and what you were doing. <coughs> and a much more related to academics example. This evening, tomorrow, might talk to your friends about what you learned in this class today, or your parents, or somebody you might talk to, and you're going to remember you were sitting here in this time in this place. 20 years from now, you'll have no idea who I am, or hopefully you won't remember this drab room at all, um, but you'll remember some of the material you learned in this class. And let me prove that to you. How many of you know who the first president of the United States was? Everybody, right? How many of you can tell me when and where you were when you learned that fact? Nobody, right? <laughs> that has become part of your knowledge. It's simply stuff that you know. And that's the goal here. The goal here is to get what you're learning to be independent of its context. We know that episodic memory supports your knowledge, that as you experience life, when you try to remember something, early on in that learning, remembering when and where you were makes it easier to remember. So in one of my studies, we found that if people reinstated the memory context, that is, sort of where they were, what they were doing at the time, their memory was better. So one of the things you can do is, if you're in an exam and there's something that you've studied, 
you can remember or have any idea where you were or what you were doing at the time you were studying that thing, and some of us have that, you have that ability. Like, I know I was at Starbucks reading this paragraph because so-and-so interrupted me, right? If you can kind of get yourself back to that place, you might be able to get that knowledge back. Spacing out learning results in multiple contexts. So the idea here is <coughs> not necessarily different places, although that's something I recommend too, um, but what you just did beforehand and what you just did after, all of that is part of that space, what we call the spatial temporal context. So when and where you are changes every time, what mood you were in, you know, what the weather was like, what was around, all of those things are different contexts. So the more context you're in, the more likely you are to remember something later because it's less tied to that particular time and place. Okay, so take home message uh, from this in terms of how do you apply this to your sort of daily studying life is a couple of things. When you're going to sit down for a studying session, now these are things you as students do, right? You're going to sit down and study for a couple of hours. Don't study the same thing for two hours. It's 15, 20 minutes, and then switch topics, switch classes, and look at something else for a little while, and then come back. Now, pick two or three things you're going to work on that night, and spend 15 or 20 minutes per topic, and then switch it up a little bit. What you'll find is, is when you get back to the material, so I sort of suggest, let's say you're going to do three topics over two hours, you know, 20 minutes each for the first hour, and then you go back again and do 20 minutes each again for that second hour. What that does then is you can go back and figure out what you've learned well from that first 20 minute session versus what you need to work on again, because now you'll have studied something else and it won't be as familiar, and you'll lose that illusion of confidence. So that's one thing you can do. The other thing to do is to try to get in the habit of doing very short sort of daily studying. And what I used to try to do is spend a little time at the end of every day, which is probably likely after this class, because probably most of you don't have class after this, uh, but you get to the end of the day and just spend a couple minutes for each class going over everything, looking at what you did, trying to figure out where you left off in your notes because you were thinking about wanting to vacation in Bermuda, whatever. I mean, I don't, I mean, I know it's what I used to do. I still do it in meetings. Um, <coughs> let's face it, Bermuda is a lot nicer than a conference room some days. Um, but you can go back through and figure out what you might have missed. You can fill that bit in. Um, but it also means that you've taken a chance to review the material again in a different place. And then at the end of the week, kind of go through that week, figure out, you know, organize your notes, look through everything you've done that week. Spend an hour. I'm not talking about spending four hours doing this for each class. I'm going to spend 15, 20 minutes kind of reviewing things. That way when you go to start really studying for the exam, you already reviewed things two, three, four, five times. And so you've really gotten that chance to encode the material uh, in a very clear way. All right, we've got another top hat question. So this one's simple, multiple choice. A couple things to note on these, I don't know if you noticed this before, but particularly with questions like this, if your app isn't working or you don't feel like opening it, you can just text your choice to this phone number. goals again with these is, just like we've been talking about, getting you a chance to try to remember, try to think about the material. So, I think we've got most everyone. More person.
sometimes it takes it a second to catch up with what we're doing. Um, so, I'm still trying to learn my way through this app. Now we will send that to review. And of course, the answer is lose no confidence, which 94 of you got correct. So excellent. So this is what I'll be doing with these kind of um, questions, is we'll look and see what uh, people answered. Feeling of knowing is actually something that's uh, a topic from the um, cognitive literature, uh, which is sometimes that feeling you get when you feel like you know something. But the actual metacognitive illusion is this illusion of confidence. Okay, well that's what we'll get to for class after today. We'll go ahead and close that. Any questions about the Spacing effects, how to incorporate it into your study habits. Again, a couple things to, to keep in mind, spacing out over different times. Um, before we move on to desirable difficulties, uh, one of the things I do recommend is studying in different places. How many of you have been told that you should have one place that you study that's your little study area? Have you been told that? Yeah. Um, and if it's worked for you, I don't want to, if, you, if, if your studying is, is working and you feel like you're succeeding and, and you know, I want you to incorporate these ideas, these issues, these sort of findings into what you already know works, but I I'm trying to figure out ways to you know, show you how to do it better and more efficiently. One of the things you don't need to do is study in the same place. In fact, what the spacing effect shows us is that more times and places are actually a little bit better because then you're not, you don't have that sort of one particular context. Now, I do recommend someplace with less distraction. I'm actually one of these people that a little distraction is less distracting than a quiet room. Anyone else like that? Yeah, I have to have some, like, I, I, me alone in a quiet room, I'll, very quickly I'll be a little bit bonkers. I'm not one of those people that could be in prison. So I should probably not, you know, end up there. Um, <laughs> I guess it's noisy there, so there's that. But I like to do really well. I work really well in a place like Starbucks because I cannot pay attention to what's going on around me. As long as somebody isn't talking right next to me in a conversation, then that'll bug me because then I'll have to eavesdrop because I'm nosy. Um, right? Who isn't? Um, <laughs> but if there's just like a little, there's some sort of level of background noise I have to have in order to like actually function e effectively. And putting music on actually works really well for me. Um, whatever works for you, but go different places. Go to the library, go to Starbucks, get off campus for a bit. When it's nice outside, sit outside. DC, we get like nine days like that a year. Um, you know, because it'll either be too cold or it'll be like a swamp. If you guys haven't been here that long, you'll we'll get into the swamp era right before the end of the semester. Um, but you know, just mix it up. Find places that work for you. you know, uh, get out and about. So. <laughs> the next area area, uh, area to talk about is this question of what we call desirable difficulties. Uh, and this is getting back to this idea that uh, learning that requires some sort of effort is generally superior. Um, so uh, this is work that has been done by uh, Elizabeth and Bob Bjork, um, who are uh, two really terrific cognitive psychologists and a married couple at UCLA. Um, <coughs> that I've gotten to know a little bit. Nate Cornell is another guy that does this area. He's one of their students. Um, but this is one of their areas that they've really um, looked at. And this question of learning that requires effort being generally superior comes up and tends to be uh, quite well supported in a variety of, of areas and in the literature. When we get to talking about motivation, we're going to talk about this thing called the Yerkes-Dodson effect. And the basic idea with the Yerkes-Dodson effect is you have this sweet spot of motivation. And we, we talk about this in terms of sort of physiological arousal. So very low arousal means you're asleep or just you know low energy kind of thing. High level of arousal usually means you're in a super high state of awareness, super high stress. So there's this sort of sweet spot in the middle where enough sort of motivation and stress and you're doing really well. I think most of you can understand when you're in that point, right? You're, you're productive. You've got enough stress to be motivated, but not so much that you're freaking out, right? That's over here somewhere. Um, and also not so that you have nothing to do, so you're sitting around doing nothing. If you're like me, you have this sort of level of busyness that works well. <laughs> um, well, it's the same thing with desirable difficulties. 
no effort into your studying, you're not going to get a lot out of it. Working on things that you don't understand and can't figure out and aren't comfortable with um, and are just too difficult doesn't work either. So the idea here is to try to get in what we call the zone. We call this the region of proximal learning. Again, some great work by Janet Metcalf and Nate, Nate Cornell. <coughs> um, and the idea here is understanding what you already know and understand is critical to try to get into this region of proximal learning. Because if you're working with stuff you already know, you're going to be bored. Right? You don't want to be bored. But you also don't want to be so challenged that you can't, you can't actually function. That is, it's too difficult for you to do. So let me two examples from my life. When I was in middle school, um, I was failing math terribly. Turns out it's because I was bored. They put me into advanced math. Straight A student. Fast forward to graduate school. Uh, I went to graduate school at Colorado State University um, where uh, they do a lot of climate science and I was really interested in, I just have a basic passing interest in it. Um, and so there was this class on climatology and so I was like, well, I'll take that because that'll be interesting. Well, two days into it and I'm way over my head. So I had to drop that class because I just could not understand anything about climate models because it was a lot of calculus that I didn't get. So that was way beyond my difficulty. So you want to learn in an area where you're motivated but not frustrated. So understanding what you already know and understand is a really important part of this. You want to build on what you know. <coughs> that is, you need to figure out where you are and expand from there. So you don't want to focus on material that's beyond your current comprehension. You also don't want to focus on stuff you already know. So this is where we're going to start to get into questions of trying to assess your own learning. But how many of you have taken a class in the past where you focused on something you just didn't get and never managed to get it? Yeah, we've all kind of had some one of those things, right? Usually it's like calculus, or whatever that last thing in the calculus book is, whatever it was, you never figure that out. So you spend all your time trying to figure out this stupid, ridiculously hard thing, and you spend no time getting all the stuff you could have already learned. This happens when I teach stats all the time. Stats students have a tendency to focus on what they absolutely don't understand and don't spend much effort trying to figure out what they know and trying to figure out how to th what the next thing is and try to expand on that. So you want to focus on what's just beyond your current skill level. Learning is just like any other skill. You are not going to walk in to a baseball stadium and hit a major league fastball from a major league pitcher unless you have already done that a lot. That's a skill level. It's way beyond what you're going to do. Probably you're just going to get hurt, or if you're like me, you'll just watch it go by and hope to God it doesn't hit you. <coughs> Very similar to any other kind of thing we might be talking about when we're trying to expand our abilities. If you walk into a gym and haven't been to one ever, you're not going to bench press 200 pounds on your first day. right? you got to build up to that. Same thing with yoga. I'm not going to put my foot behind my head probably ever until I die. Some of you might never manage to do that. Um, certainly not going to do it on the first day in a yoga class. right? You're going to hurt yourself and snap that something or somebody's going to pull. Who knows? Um, you have to build up to that. So something like flexibility, something like strength. It's the same thing with learning. To learn to be flexible, you have to learn your strengths. And so you have to capitalize on what you know and build beyond that. But you want to be in that area where you're challenged but not frustrated. So all of this leads to some issues in trying to avoid some traps. So we want to be challenged want to mix up our learning, and we want to avoid illusions of knowing. So it's a great time to have this. I usually I keep Donald Rumsfeld in these talks, because when I give talks to professors, I certainly understand this. Donald Rumsfeld used to give the best press conferences in Washington, D.C. history. Um, you know, aside what might happen, we're probably going to get some pretty entertaining press conferences coming up. So at least there'll be a spectator sport aspect to this. But Rumsfeld was it for a while. There's this great quote about metacognition that's not about metacognition. Um, there are known knowns. These are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know that we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things that we don't know we don't know. Well, if we parse that down to what it means, <laughs> I remember watching this press conference. And I thought, God almighty, what did he just say? Um, basically, he's saying you have to know what you know and you have to know what you don't know. 
So why don't we parse this down to somebody who's a little bit wiser. The wise man is one who knows what he does not know. And that's one of the goals of trying to strategize your learning is you want to figure out what you know and what you don't know and focus on learning what you don't know. I'm going to start to smell, sound like Rumsfeld myself. <coughs> and that's one of the goals of trying to evaluate your own metacognition and meta memory. So basic introduction to these concepts, metacognition and meta memory are knowledge and awareness of our own cognitive processes or our own memory. So when we're talking about meta memory, we're talking about evaluating and understanding and knowing what we know about our own memory. With metacognition, it's about our, meta our cognitive processes. This is critical to understanding learning, that is, understanding our own metacognition and metamemory skills, because how do we know what we've actually learned versus what we think we have learned? This is one of the things that we've talked about all along today, is trying to figure out what we know versus what we think we know versus what we really know. And the goal here is for you to be able to identify those things that you know, focus on learning the things that you don't know, and then you'll know all of it. And then you'll do well in your exams. That's the, you know, the goal here is for you to succeed by not falling prey to these illusions. So in the lab, and this will be very brief and quick, we ask people to do what we call judgments of learning, where we predict later memory performance using these judgments of learning. In general, we are all terrible at this. It's not, I mean, this is just you know, participants. In general, people are bad at evaluating their own memory. Uh, we often fall prey to these metacognitive illusions. We'll talk a little bit about these. <coughs> in which we think we understand how our memory works. And so we fall prey to this illusion that because something is easier, it should be easier to remember. So we'll talk about this study um, by uh, Matt Rose and Alan Castle uh, on perceptual fluency effects, and then we'll return to um, Shanna's study on constructive fluency. Let me move up and come back. So this is basic idea um, about perceptual fluency. So if we ask participants which of these two words they're more likely to remember, they'll almost universally say that bird is easier to remember than dog. It's a bigger print. We feel like it should be easier. When we ask people if horse is easier to remember than canary, they almost always say that canary is going to be easier to remember than horse. When in actuality, in general, these two have about the same memory properties. That is, one is just as easy to remember as the other. But you are much more likely to remember horse than you are canary. And the reason for that is it's a desirable difficulty. That is, it took effort. For those of you who can actually read that that says horse, even standing right here, I can hardly see that that says horse. Now, I would never recommend that you write out your notes in some crazy curly Q font, uh, because you, you'll just end up at the eye doctor. <coughs> the point here is to avoid this kind of illusion. So the problem is, is we feel like we have learned because the material seems easier, because it was easier to process. And that's why we call this perceptual fluency. It was easier to see. It was easier to read. There are other studies in this area um, looking at different ways in which you sort of manipulate how hard it is to read or see something. And again, there is this sort of level at which we're more likely to remember things later if it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, Shannon and her students have done um, this really clever study on instructor fluency. Uh, they had students do, they had recorded a student uh, giving a lecture on cats. Um, cause the internet loves cats. Um, and <coughs> in one instance, the instructor's very organized, very fluent, very clear sort of about you know what the points are, uh, what they're supposed to know. The other is a little bit more disfluent, less organized. The instructor doesn't really speak very well. So they kind of hem and haw and go back and forth. And what sh they found uh, in this particular study is that participants thought they would remember more from the fluent instructor and less from the disfluent instructor. But in actuality, because it took more work to try to understand what the disfluent professor was saying, they were more likely to remember that later. Now, 
I don't want your professors to be disorganized and <laughs> uh, bad speakers. The point is, you have to watch out for when you're in class, really interested in what somebody's saying, thinking that you'll remember it later. So when I took um, this history and systems of psychology class when I was an undergraduate, <coughs> this prof professor named Wayne Viney, who had the most interesting, crazy stories, like he knew B.F. Skinner, um, and so you'd sit there and he would sort of tell these stories throughout class, and then you'd get done and realize you had a blank piece of paper in front of you and you had no idea what was going to be on the exam later because you got so interested in it. Fortunately, he had written the textbook, so that made it a little easier. But the thing to watch out for is thinking that we'll remember something better later because it's, it feels easier. So that's kind of the point there. So how do we improve meta memory? Well, usually through testing. So in the cognitive literature, we actually can show your memory's improved by doing what we call a delayed judgment of learning. And in the delayed judgment of learning, <coughs> what happens is, rather than asking you how likely are you to remember something later, we say, you know that thing we asked you that you studied earlier? You're going to have a memory test here in a minute. How likely are you to remember it? Sounds complicated. Usually we do this with word pairs. So we're presented the word dog. How likely are, are you to remember the word that came along with it? And basically why, the reason why students are better at this, or participants are better at this, is because they answer the question by trying to remember. So rather than looking at something and saying, oh sure, I'll remember this later, by delaying that judgment, by saying, you know. But so an example of this would be right now if I asked you, how likely are you to remember on an exam um, about the testing effect? You'd have to think back and think, well, can I remember what he was talking about earlier? And evaluate your memory based on your ability to remember. So the whole point of this kind of delayed judgment of learning is you're actually trying to remember and then evaluating your memory that way. So essentially, students evaluate their learning by trying to remember. And that's the critical piece here for your part of this is <coughs> Sometimes the best thing to do is set aside everything and see what you can remember. So one of the things that I, well, so when I was an undergraduate, I worked full time. I was actually general manager of a nightclub. <coughs> so I kind of had to structure my uh, days um, very carefully around my schedule. And so one of the things I did, in, uh, I was taking this very intense sensation and perception class. And I knew it was going to be difficult uh, when exam time came around. And so what I did is I generated an outline of all my notes, studied that for quite a bit, and then I put it all aside and I tried to remember the entire outline from memory. Now that's completely dorkish and I don't expect you guys to do that kind of thing, but it really worked. <laughs> um, I also, that's how I got through an international relations class too, is essentially doing the same thing. Because what you then have is a record of here's all the things I remembered, and you can go back and say, all right, here are the things I need to study. That's the reason why that works so well. So using self-testing to evaluate your memory is a great way to do that. Now, you don't have to try to write your notes from memory. I don't expect you guys to be as dorky as I was. Still am. Um, but diagnosing your own memory, diagnosing your studying is a really good technique um, by going through and seeing what you know and what you don't know. So creating quizzes, see which answers you can get correct. Having your friends, really great suggestion <coughs> is share quizzes with your friends because you're going to be able to answer the ones you wrote, right? And they'll, they'll be able to answer the ones they wrote. But now you're going to be able to share each other's questions and try to figure out how to answer each other's questions. So the whole point here is to use self-testing to evaluate your memory. So not only do you get the cognitive benefits of testing, but you also can figure out what you need to study more and not study more. So you're not wasting your time studying stuff you know and focusing on learning the stuff you don't know yet. A couple things to sort of wrap up this discussion. Uh, one of the things I like to make sure I include in any discussion of learning is to dispense with the idea of learning style. There's no empirical evidence to support the idea of different learning styles. How many of you have taken a learning styles evaluation. 
like learning your learning style. Yeah, a lot of places still do this. What we know is that there may be different learning preferences. There are things that people like to do. This is gets at a question of motivation and learning. And that's one of the things, if you find something that you like and you enjoy and it's a good way to study and you've succeeded, keep doing it. Because motivation is an important part of this. But some of the ways in which people prefer to learn are not actually tied to any improvements in learning. And so uh, it's an important question about what kind of uh, learning we're doing and whether or not it's actually associated with any learning outcome. So, so there's some things people like to do, but that doesn't mean that, we're, that they're resulting in better memory. So if we s as we see from the meta-memory literature, some of these things may actually be worse for memory. That is, if we cater to people's learning styles, we may actually be disadvantaging them by um, making things seem easier to remember when in fact they might not be. So, again, figure out what works for you, but don't get wrapped up in this idea of learning style. And last thing to finish up uh, here is to talk about some encoding strategies. Uh, the first of these are mnemonic techniques. These are the things that work well for some things uh, and for some people. The method of loci uh, is one of the sort of most ancient methods of uh, mnemonic techniques, and these are just basically memory tricks. And the basic idea here is you associate items with location. So if you were going to do this, you would, you know, pick some location where you can place things and remember where they were. Has anyone ever heard of memory palaces? Yeah. What's that? Have you done it though? Yeah. What have you done? Did it work? What were you trying to remember? Formulas? Yeah. So this works really well for some people. And so if it's something that works, it's, it's, I highly recommend it. Um, but if you're really interested in this, there are actually memory competitions, because there are people that are dorkier than I am. Um, <laughs> this is a really great book, though, called Memory Palaces, where a guy talks about, he's actually a journalist who went out to investigate this and then actually became a memory champion. Um, so it is one thing that can work, because we, some people have really good spatial memory. And so associating things with locations might actually work. Paved word mnemonics are where you peg a to-be-remembered item to other words. Um, and oftentimes this can be sort of a peg word mnemonic slash acronym. I'll find a light here. So one of the ones I often talk about, all right, well, there's the Roy G. Div. You guys know what this is? Like the colors of the rainbow. This is one that has been with me longer than I'd like to tell you, but the mnemonic is keep people cool or frogs go south, which is pegged to remembered that since I was in the sixth grade, which was some time ago. Um, but basically, it's kingdom, phylum, or class, order, family, genus, species. So this is the order of all that, but it's tied to other words. So that's the kind of peg word mnemonic. Those of you who go to med school, you're going to get a lot of these, right? So you remember some sequence of words that are then tied to some other um, series of things to remember. So again, these are effective for remembering items in their order, but not necessarily very good for remembering concepts, their meaning, understanding. So I can remember this order, but that doesn't mean I know anything about what a phylum is. So other effective tools are things like elaboration, where you refine the, refine the meaning of material, try to embellish it with additional information, ask yourself questions, Consider material from other perspectives. Construct your own definitions. Study both verbally and with imagery. So try to picture what's happening. It's one of the reasons why you know, when you're studying anatomy, one of the best things you actually can have is you can actually have a 3D model of 
trying to study things like neural anatomy. The point here is to try to elaborate on what you're trying to learn, to try to come up with ways to learn. Yeah, do you have a question? Oh, sorry, I'm just joking. Um, but by constructing your own definitions, constructing your own examples, all of these are ways in which you can elaborate on the material. These are really good techniques for coming up with ways to encode material in more meaningful ways. The point is to make it more meaningful to you. And so one of the things you can do is capitalize on what's called the self-reference effect. And the self-reference effect is where you basically apply something to your life, where you're trying to learn something and you try to make it meaningful to you. So this is where you get people who are interested in stats and are interested, sorry, are trying to learn statistics, but they're interested in sports, and so they learn statistics and sports as kind of a combined effort because they use it to understand things that they're talking about. So think of examples, relate to the material you already know, use self-reference, create stories. The whole point of this is to come up with as many ways as possible for you to remember it in a way that's tied to what you know. So I'll have my examples, I'll have my ways in which I describe things, but if you can make them personal to you, you're much more likely to remember them later. So to sort of sum this whole discussion of learning strategies up. The things we want to try to do are be mindful of the way in which we study, be conscious and present in the way you're doing it, in a way that actually requires effort, use retrieval as a way to both encode memory and to diagnose your own memory, test yourself, and try to mix things up a little bit. So I want to, um, we're going to skip these things. Um, there's some things that you can read. These are all posted. Um, if you're really interested in getting a pretty good understanding of this, there's a great um, book by Brown, Rodiger, and McDaniel. It's a science book, but that was written by um, a, he's a novelist or a journalist. I can't remember. So it's basically narrative nonfiction. So it tells you how to study in a much more approachable fa fashion. So I highly recommend it. Then there's, of course, some peer-reviewed material for you to look at. All right. We will talk about psychology and its foundations on Monday.